Good morning, everyone, and let me give you a warm welcome uh, on this Lord's Day to another Abbey Green Fellowship moment, an opportunity for us to, to be together and to lift up our voices in the praise and adoration of God, and of course, to give ourselves to the study of Holy Scripture. And it's a delight, isn't it, for us to be able to do so, that we have been granted the freedom to be Christian men and women. And we are thankful to God for the grace that saved us and for the grace that we know will ever sustain us on our journey to glory and the very grace that will ensure that we are richly blessed and encouraged in our faith this morning. So another fellowship moment and it's the gift of God to us. Let's make sure that we put it to good use. Now, let's begin uh, by praying. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for the opportunity it gives us to come away from the world and to have a moment of fellowship together in your presence, whereby we come as a spiritual family. We come to honour you. We come to adore you. We come to bear testimony that you alone are God, that you are the creator of heaven and earth, that you are the giver of good gifts, that you are the father of our Lord Jesus, and that you are the source of all blessing. You are worthy of the praise that we offer. We come to that we might give ourselves to the study of scripture, how we love your word from Genesis to Revelation, we know it to be infallible and inerrant, a word that makes your wisdom available to us, a word that issues us with command and encouragements and promises and guarantees, a word that is able to excite us, thrill us, inspire and direct us, that we might live our lives under your blessing, ever growing in grace and knowledge as we journey home to the everlasting kingdom of heaven. It is our privilege and joy to have this moment of fellowship this morning, and we commend it to you, and we pray that by the ministry of the Spirit, we will know ourselves to be ministered to in ways that will be to our spiritual gain. So we commend ourselves to you this morning, and we seek your blessing, the blessing of Almighty God, the blessing of a Heavenly Father as he bestows good gifts upon the lives of his children. So hear our prayer and bless us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing this morning uh, our opening psalm which is Psalm 103, and we're going to sing from verse 1 through to verse 5. O thou my soul, bless God the Lord.
And now we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God, that we can read Holy Scripture together. We're going to open our Bibles in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we're interested very much in chapter 6 and in those uh, verses from verse 10 on, uh, verse 10 through to verse 18. So let's read the Word of God together. Finally, says Paul, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, Take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Amen. And may God bless uh, this reading of his word and bless our study of it in due course. Now we're going to lift up our voices together that we might sing the hymn, There is a hope that burns within my heart.
Now let's join together in prayer as we prepare ourselves for the study of Holy Scripture. Let's pray. God our Father, as always, we count it a privilege to be able to study the Word of God together. We know that this is your breathed out word, infallible, inerrant, a word that we can trust from Genesis to Revelation, a word that is your re revelation to us, that we might be knowledgeable Christians, that we might be instructed Christians, that we might be men and women who know what it is to be thrilled by the sound and the teaching of the Word of God. We come this morning and we are eager to hear your voice. Speak to us through your word and let ours be the blessing. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're turning our attention again this morning to Ephesians chapter 6 uh, from verse 10 to verse 18. And we're returning to this portion of scripture with a determination to carefully and prayerfully study it in detail. A portion of scripture that has been for us uh, increasingly uh, and persuasively making impact on us. And this as it has alerted us to the fact that as Christians there can be no doubting of the reality that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have been called to a life of what we've been terming warrior living. Christians truly committed to Christ and well taught by scripture will not have any expectation in the slightest of the living of a life, one lived in his service, which will know as its norm a style of spiritual living that is casual, comfortable, or complacent. In other words, a stress-free life, empty of difficulty, empty of distress, empty of demand, empty of any kind of dilemma whatsoever. An undisturbed life, knowing nothing but peace, joy, and everlasting contentment, health and well-being, the order of the day. And many are the charlatans around the world, with many being household names, especially in America, who have become personally and immensely rich by suggesting that the Christian life is an easy one. With the reason being, so they say, that God spends all of his time trying to find ways to please us, particularly having as his driving ambition the goal of striving to keep us healthy and wealthy. The people who exercise such ministries are actually um, those who are enemies of the people of God, indeed of all people in general. And this because, you see, they are not preaching the whole truth of the gospel of God and to the faithful nourishing of the souls of the saints. Nor are they preaching the gospel, the true gospel, to the vital saving of the souls of sinners. Indeed, when all is said and done, they are in fact enemies of God given as they are to peddling the lies of the devil, the very lies he has designed and developed in order to turn people away from the real truths of the word of God, and this in order to suck them into the captivity of his life-ruining and soul-destroying rule. It is the way of these charlatans then to offer sinful men and women exactly what they want to hear. They want to know the promise of a life that will be an easy life to live. 
They will never know illness. They will never struggle with disease because God will promise to keep them healthy. They will never have to worry about the paying of bills or being short of money because God will always make them wealthy. God will be there to make them a distinctive people because they will never be sick and they will never be short of money. That's the kind of gospel that people will love to hear and will flock to hear and even pay money to hear. It's exactly the gospel that they were designed for themselves. The invention of a God who will meet all of their needs and make their lives cosy and comfortable. A God who will never speak to them in a challenging fashion or in a commanding fashion or an instructing or demanding fashion. No, he will be a God who will simply look for opportunities to pour down the blessing of health and wealth upon those who are his people. It's an attractive gospel. And it's the gospel of the charlatans of this modern age. And they are too many to number, but you, I'm sure you will know their names. If you watch Christian television, you will find them in their many guises, using the word of God, using it in a way whereby at times you think it sounds like the word of God. But you have to have discernment. Because when you do, you will hear them saying things whereby they have added to the word of God and they have made promises that God does not make. And they have turned God into a supermarket kind of God who is simply there for you to visit when you need him, to do what you bid him to do. This God who will keep you healthy even in a fallen world. This God who will keep you wealthy even if you do nothing to accrue wealth. God will give it to you. Yes, it's a popular gospel. It's the gospel of the world. It's the gospel of the kingdom of darkness. It's the gospel designed to steal the souls of men and women from underneath the real gospel of God. It's a gospel designed ultimately to destroy the souls of men and women. It's the gospel of the devil, this health and wealth nonsense. It's a gospel designed to suck men and women into the captivity of his life, ruining and soul-destroying rule. Now, of course, it is the way of God to be a source of blessing to his people. I'm not denying that fundamental truth. God does bless his people. And this supernaturally, in wonderful and timely ways, and always so experience has taught us in perfect providential fashion. But while this is absolutely true and gloriously true and is beyond dispute, it is also a revealed biblical fact that living as we do in a fallen world, it is a reality that those who follow Christ, those who follow the biblical Christ, not the Christ of their imagination, but the Christ, who is the revealed Son of God, that those who follow Christ are not without their sworn enemies. The Lord himself made this abundantly clear in his Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 5, um, in words recorded in verse 10 through to verse 12, blessed are those, says Jesus, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there will be people who will be mine, who will live their lives in a fashion that will be distinctively righteous, a life form that will reveal them to be different 
from other men and women because their lives will know the quality of righteousness. Their lives will reflect the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. And the outcome, they will be persecuted. But says Jesus, blessed are those of mine who are persecuted because they are righteous, because they are different and distinctive from all the men and women of the world, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus goes on, blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when people persecute you. And blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. If you are attacked and insulted and persecuted and lied against because of me, because you cleave to my teaching and you cleave to my ways, know this for your encouragement. I don't promise you health and freedom from trouble in life. I don't promise you prosperity, but I do promise you that you will be spiritually and deeply and supernaturally blessed. So, says Jesus, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus is making it clear that it was the way of those who followed him to experience the persecution of the world. He was saying the prophets were persecuted before you and you will be persecuted. Why? You will be persecuted because you are mine. The revelation being the righteousness of your life. You will be a challenge to the world and the world will hate you. But know this, you will be blessed. Don't you see, our Lord's warning is emphatic and unambiguous. His people, far from knowing a life of health and wealth and peace and comfort, will know much of the pressing and disturbing reality of persecution. Yet, there is great blessing on offer in the Christian life. Has God not said in Hebrews 13 verse 5, Never will I leave you or forsake you. God is saying, in the midst of your dilemma, I won't leave you, I won't forsake you. In the midst, in the midst of your struggles with illness, with disease, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. In the moments when you find yourself to be impoverished or worrying about how you will be able to make your way in the world or to pay this bill or that bill, I want you to know I'm not promising to make you prosperous and hugely wealthy, but I'm telling you, I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord, you see, would have us know that he will be our constant companion. He will be our wise counsellor. He will be our great champion. In the darkest of days, he's telling us, in the darkest of days, he will always be available for us to lean on and at every moment of need be ever ready to carry us in his strong and loving arms. Yes, there are wonderful blessings this side of glory, but I want you to note that they belong to the persecuted people of God. Those who know the opposition and the aggression of the world. The blessings belong to those who are recognisable as followers of Christ. With the ultimate blessing being, of course, and this at its best, 
and in its fullness, the ultimate blessing being the wonderful and glorious reward of God that is kept for his beloved to enjoy on their arrival in heaven. What is that reward? It is a crown of glory, a crown that will never fade. First Peter chapter 5 verse 4. Jesus, ever the realist, also said to his disciples in Matthew 24 verse 9, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And again, in similar fashion, in John 15 verse 20, they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. With the Apostle Paul summing up the teaching of the Lord by declaring in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You see, the teaching of the word of God is very clear and Jesus is particularly clear. He's saying, if you would follow me, if you desire to follow me, I'm not going to promise you health. I'm not going to promise you wealth. I'm going to tell you rather that if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. You're going to know something of suffering and difficulty in this world. There is a cost involved in following me. I'm not going to hide it from you. You need to know if you're going to live a godly life, if you're going to live in righteous fashion, if you're going to show that you are distinctive from the fallen men and women of this world who belong to the kingdom of darkness and are on their way to ultimate destruction, you need to know that if you seek to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. So count the cost before you follow me. No talk of health, no talk of wealth, but talk of a challenging life. Against this background then, it follows that with Paul's help, we have been discovering that there is an expectation of us from on high. Namely, that living as we do in a fallen world and knowing its enmity, it follows that in the face of its determined persecution and hatred, we have due cause to take seriously our responsibility to prove ourselves to be people who are committed to warrior living. And this because we know that behind the reality of the persecution and opposition that we face, we have a sworn enemy. One whose determination it is to seek our spiritual annihilation, to seek the destroying of the church of Jesus Christ, and to, to seek the stealing of the souls of men and women. And all of this, so the evil one hopes to the shaming and defeating of the Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then is quite insistent that we be in no doubt that there is a spiritual war going on and that we are very much in the middle of it. Failure to register this fact, failure not to take it seriously, at least not enough so that we begin to seek to try to rise to the standards expected of those who are on the Lord's side, will ensure, sadly, that when the devil is encountered in spiritual combat, he will always easily and embarrassingly have the beating of us. With Paul's help, though, we have been discovering just how important it is that we get our thinking right, that in turn we might get our living right. It is, you will remember, that as Bible-taught and Bible-obedient Christians, 
who have learned to think right, that we will be able to find ourselves better placed to live right. It is as we think right that we live right, and this to our spiritual gain and the glory of our Lord. Let me remind you then, as we turn again to Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18, that our theme continues to be that of the life of you in him, meaning the warrior life you live in him and for him as you live in the world. The very way of living, indeed the only way, that leads to delight, blessing and assured victory. Let me remind you then that thus far we have noticed Paul's counsel in verse 10. We are to be strong in the Lord and with good reason. We are at war with an enemy who has clearly set his sights on us. We are in the crosshairs of the devil's focused hatred and aggression. At Paul's command, verse 11, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul's conviction, still in verse 11, if we are to fight well and so prove ourselves resistant to the wiles and ways of the devil, we need to put on the full armour of God. Paul's confidence, still in verse 11, he was of a sure mind that properly armoured, the people of God can stand against the devil as they fight on to victory. Paul's comprehension, verse 12, remember, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul would have us know that we face a serious and powerful enemy who is not without willing and wicked agents who are ever ready to do his evil bidding. The church needs to remind itself that we do face a serious and powerful enemy. Sometimes you get the impression that the church is ambling through. It's having a, a wander through the world and nothing very much disturbs it. It's all about trying to look good and sound good and be good. And it seems at times it's ignoring the fact that we are in at war facing a serious and a powerful enemy who is more determined to destroy the church than the church is to fight him. Remember, it was the Apostle John who told us, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5 verse 19, we are surrounded by the forces of hell and it is our duty to stand against them, not just as individuals, but collectively as the church of Jesus Christ, determined to shine like a light in the darkness, determined to be a voice crying in the wilderness as it declares the whole counsel of God, as it proclaims the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. The church needs to take seriously the reality that it is at war against a formidable foe. Paul's commending. Therefore, Put on the full armour of God, he says in verse 13, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. The apostle commends his command, in effect saying, you really should obey my command for good reason. Doing so will save your life. Paul's clarity, he would have us Know that Satan is our most deadly enemy and that on the field of spiritual battle, he is a formidable foe. 
to be able to face such an evil and implacable enemy with any hope of tasting of victory, we have to square up to him. Doing so, of course, not in our own power. That would be a recipe for disaster. We must square up to him, doing so in the power of God, while wearing the armour of God. If we would know the power of God at work in our life in the midst of spiritual warfare, we need to wear the armour of God. Paul has already taught us that armour wearing allows us to stand in firmness, especially when we are found wearing the belt of truth. He says, remember in verse 14, we looked at this last time in some detail, stand firm then, says Paul, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. One of the first things that a Roman soldier did, you'll remember, as he prepared for battle, was to put his belt on and tighten it up. The belt or girdle was like a kind of protective apron. It served to protect him against the horizontal swipes from a sword. So when Paul speaks of the belt of truth, what truth does he have in mind? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. Does he not in John 17 verse 17, when he declared in his high priestly prayer as he was speaking to God, your word is truth. Men and women would say today that their word is truth. But the reality is, and Jesus tells us this, it's God's word that is truth. God's word alone that is truth and full of the richest and deepest of wisdom. As we prepare for battle then, we are, as it were, to wrap the word of God around us, our belt, the integrating and linking item of all of our armour is the plain truth of Scripture, the revelation of God's mind, will and ways made known in, holy, in the Holy Bible. Paul wants us to know that it is absolutely essential for believers in their battles against the schemes of the devil to know the truth of the word of God. Why then, and this disturbs me, why then are Christians not so interested in Bible study or in listening to the detailed preaching of the word of God? I heard someone say recently, that where preaching is concerned, that brevity is the order of the day. Is that really so? Is it right that Christians in the 21st century want or are demanding brief homilies from their preachers? Certainly we know that, that sinners who belong to the world have no love for the word of God, have no interest in hearing it, and the briefer the better as far as they are concerned, but for Christians to think likewise. How can that be? They want homilies from their preachers. And this, rather than properly prepared and prayed over faithful teaching and preaching of the depths, delights, drama, and details of the Word of God. Where do we get this idea, Christians, that brevity is the order of the day, that sermons should be as short and sweet as possible, when the Lord Jesus himself has told us that God's Word is truth? and is given to us as one of his great gifts that we might know the truth of the word of God to the shaping of our lives, to the directing of our lives, to the inspiring of our lives, to the blessing of our lives, to the feeding of our souls. And yet, in this modern age, we cannot get Christians to gather together for the midweek study of the word of God. Thankfully, we don't have that problem here in Abbey Green, but I know for a fact it is a big problem. 
so that many churches no longer have midweek Bible studies or midweek prayer meetings or the sermons of the, the preachers are getting shorter and shorter and funnier and funnier and lighter and lighter, all to engage a world that has no interest in the word of God and certainly no interest in a word that is shallow and superficial and utterly empty of any real power or demand from God. Jesus has told us that the only truth worth knowing, worth believing and worth obeying is the truth of God. To be clothed in the armour of this truth is to be enabled to stand firm unto victory when we face the devil and his demons upon the battlefield of spiritual combat. So put on your gospel armour, wrap yourself in the truth of God and make ready to fight the good fight unto glorious and guaranteed victory. A soldier though, having first buckled on his belt, would then put on his breastplate, the breastplate. No Roman soldier would ever have considered going into battle without his breastplate on. In similar fashion, uh, says Paul, so it will be for the Christian soldier involved in spiritual warfare. Having first put on the belt of truth, um, he will put on his breastplate, that is, the breastplate of righteousness. A Roman soldier knew the great value of a breastplate. It was a sleeveless piece of armour in the style of a smock. It was made from tough leather or heavy linen. It was designed to protect the body um, from chest to thighs and on occasion the back as well. The front part was reinforced with metal, either bronze or chain mail, involving the use of overlapping slices of animal hooves or horns or pieces of metal. Some were made of large pieces of metal, moulded or hammered to conform to the shape of the body. It was a heavy piece or a heavy duty piece of equipment which gave defence to all of a soldier's vital organs, not least his heart, lungs and intestines. To fight without a breastplate would have been the height of foolishness and, and something of a death wish. In the heat and storm of violent, close order combat, a soldier's chances of survival when fighting without a breastplate would have been slim indeed. The odds would have been firmly stacked against him. Similarly then for the Christian warrior, whose battle is against the evil ruler of this world. Let him take to the battlefield improperly or carelessly dressed, and he risks being severely wounded even brought to his knees in sad and shameful defeat. Professional soldiers knew how to bring their opponents down as they aimed to pierce the heart or slash the intestines in order to disembowel a man where he stood. It was kill or be killed. Know then that in like fashion, Christian warriors face an enemy equally determined to strike similar blows to the heart or the intestines. Now to understand what I'm getting at here, let me remind you that in ancient Jewish thinking, the heart represented the mind and the will. So when you attack the heart, you're attacking the mind and the will. The heart represents the mind and the will. 
while the bowels were considered to be the seat of the emotions. Hence the words in paraphrase 40 verse 4 relating to the prodigal son. Words that always bring a smile to my face, even though they shouldn't, because I know what they are really referring to. Paraphrase 40 verse 4. He said, and hastened to his home, to seek his father's love. The father sees him from afar, and all his bowels move. In other words, his emotions were greatly stirred, and he knew much of the passion of joy. We find a deadly, determined, and experienced enemy who knows where to strike. He aims for the heart and the bowels, and does so in the fiercest and most evil manner possible. In other words, he launches direct attacks on our minds and emotions. In the war with the Roman soldier, he would go for the heart, he would go for the intestines, he would strike his enemy down. And in spiritual warfare, the devil goes for the heart, he goes for our minds, he goes for our intestines, he goes for our emotions. He creates a sinful environment around us, designed to tempt us into thinking wrong thoughts, into feeling wrong emotions. With dark skill and demonic expertise, he sets about clouding our minds with false doctrine, with false principles and false information even at times false goals. And this he does to perplex, confuse and misdirect us in our thinking. He would seek to stop us thinking wisely in relation to the truth of God. And this with the goal of impairing or destroying our trust in God. Similarly, he attacks our emotions and this as he seeks to pervert our affections, morals, loyalties, goals and commitments. Keen as he is that he would bring us to the place of loving the world and its ways more than we love God and his ways. Do you see his strategy? He desires to snatch the word of God from our minds and to replace it with his own perverse ideas. He wants to replace pure living with immorality, greed, envy, hate, and every other vice under the sun. He wants to say, is this word of God really true? And then to suggest, well, it's not true. You better add to it. You better subtract from it. You better dilute it. This word is not relevant today. This word needs to be made as brief as possible. This word needs to be made as simple as possible and as shallow and as superficial. You see, the attacks that take place in our hearts upon the word of God in our mind to change our will. This word is not really as true as it should be. Therefore, in our will, we will not be as obedient to it anymore. He attacks the word of God. He goes for our heart. He goes for our mind and our will. And then he comes against our emotions. Where is your God Where, when you need him? Do you feel his love? Do you feel his care? He attacks our emotions. His goal, don't you see, is to make wreck of our lives. Psychologically, emotionally and spiritually. To turn us into the kind of people who laugh at sin. The kind of people who no longer take sin seriously. The kind of people 
who accommodate sin, who begin to justify sin, even to promote sin. He would have us be the kind of people who choose to accommodate sin instead of mourning over sin, instead of showing repentance where sin is a reality, confessing sin before God as we sincerely seek his forgiveness. No, he doesn't want us to be that kind of person. He wants us to accommodate sin. If we are to defend ourselves against such attacks upon our thoughts and emotions, designed as they are to spiritually impair, if not seriously wound us, then we need to make sure that we are found wearing the breastplate of righteousness. That is, protecting our thoughts and emotions by wrapping them in the armour that God has provided. Now, when we speak of wearing the breastplate of righteousness, you will surely know that the one thing Paul is not speaking about here is self-righteousness. The idea that we are good enough to battle the devil on our own, that we are good enough that the devil would never dare take us on. If that's how we think, then the devil will bring us down. Self-righteousness is not only a sin, it is in fact the worst kind of sin. So what does Paul have in mind when he speaks of the breastplate of righteousness? I suppose the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Think of his words in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The doctrine of imputed righteousness found in Genesis 15 verse 6 and fully explained by Paul in the New Testament, particularly in Romans and also elsewhere in Ephesians. This truth explained by Paul is the wonderful truth that God by his grace declares men and women who have believing and saving faith in Jesus Christ He declares them to be righteous in his sight. And this, not because they are full of merit and worthiness, but rather because Christ is full of merit and worthiness. And so it is that by undeserved grace, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to believing people. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. Rather, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Imputed meaning that the righteousness of Christ is counted by God as being ours. So that when he looks at us, he sees us not in our sin, not clothed in our sin, he sees us as believing people clothed in the righteousness of Christ. To know by faith the blessing of imputed righteousness is to know that our sins have been forgiven and that the holiness of Christ is counted by God as belonging to us Do you know what that means? It means that we are as holy as Christ, not in ourselves, but because we are in him, we share in his holiness. When God looks at us, he sees that we are clothed in the holiness of Christ, making us as holy as Christ. What an incredible thought. It follows then that in fellowship with God, the gift of his grace, we are the righteousness 
of Christ. We radiate the righteousness of Christ. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are the righteousness of Christ. So we Christians are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and this from the very moment of our conversion. And this righteousness is something we wear now and forever. Luther said that when the devil came knocking at the door of his heart, he would send the Lord Jesus to the door. Christ would say, Martin Luther used to live here but he has moved out. I now live here. Then, said Luther, when the devil would see the nail prints on the hands of Christ and his pierced side, he would take flight immediately. Now all of this is true. God's imputed righteousness protects us from the powers of hell. But it does not solely of itself protect us in every way from the warlike attacks of Satan upon our person in this world. Because, you see, we need to remember that Paul talks about putting on the armour of God. We are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Clearly, then, while the idea of the protection of imputed righteousness was not far from Paul's thoughts. He must also have had something else in mind when he encouraged the Ephesians to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And indeed he had. And what he was encouraging the believers in Ephesus to do was to put on the armour of right living, of righteous living. Spiritually speaking, the breastplate is the armour of living a devout, committed, loyal and holy life. Paul has this to say in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And then... He says in Romans 6 again, verses 11 to 13, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Now think back to what Paul said to the Ephesians in earlier parts of his letter. In Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 24, he said, Put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he adds in Ephesians 5 verses 8 to 11, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. So that when the devil comes calling, you will say to him, as you're wearing your armour, you will say to him, in the righteousness of Christ, I no longer live here. It's Christ who lives here. And therefore, I will have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Wear the armour. The emphasis in all of this teaching is that Christians should give themselves to ethical living, to right living to the kind of living truly worthy of their calling. How does Paul put it in Ephesians 4 
verse 1, I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. To know that something is right and not to do it is to leave a gaping hole in our armour. One that our adversary will be quick to use to his advantage when he comes to wound by pointing out our compromises, our inconsistencies and the fact that our lives are making no impact for good on those around us. Living that is not right robs our testimony of power and makes us an ineffective witness to our neighbours. Fail then to wear the armour of a practical holy life and you rob yourself of joy and peace. Christians who say that it doesn't really matter how they think or talk or act because all sins past, present and future are covered by Christ's blood are well off the mark. Their position is irrational and unscriptural and makes them a target for the devil's wounding attention. Listen again to Paul's counter-argument in Romans 6, the opening two verses. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in sin any longer? If we are to fight well, and know the taste of victory over the one who is our sworn enemy, then we must pay heed to Paul when he tells us in no uncertain terms that we need to put on the whole armour of God. It follows then that if we are to take our place on the field of spiritual battle, doing so, able to stand in firmness, then we need to put on the belt of truth, followed by the breastplate of righteousness. Wonderful indeed is the armour that is ours to wear. It gives us great confidence, such as is born of faith and energised and empowered by the revealed and inspiring truth of God. And this as we find ourselves taking our stand against the devil on the battlefield of ever-raging spiritual conflict, doing so knowing that we will be able to stand in firm, resolute and unblinking fashion, determined not to give an inch of holy ground to the evil one and his marauding hordes of dark and deadly demons. There will be no sounding of retreat by the gospel forces of God. Rather, there will be a determined and unyielding standing in spiritual firmness. And quite right too. For how could it be otherwise when in Christ we are the righteousness of God, his beloved, his elect, his blessed ones, the very people who wear the merit of holiness and righteousness of his Son, and as such are destined in Christ to share in his victory over all the powers of this world, over all the powers that would dare to stand against him. Only those who wear the righteousness of Christ have the guarantee of triumphant homecoming to the kingdom of heaven, there to receive their everlasting crown of glory. Are you a person with real and saving faith? Then yours is the assurance that when God looks at you, as you live your life out in Christ, he sees you clothed in the righteousness of his Son. That means you are most definitely glory bound. Hallelujah. Now make sure that you have your armour on. All of it. And so rise up and get to the fighting of the good fight. Hit the devil with all the power and force 
of your unyielding faith and holy living. Hit the devil with all that you have as you live to the glory of Christ. Hit the devil with all the power and force of your faith and holy living to the glory of God and send him back to hell to think again. Amen. And now we're going to sing as we close our fellowship moment this morning. We're going to sing the hymn, Who Would True Valour See? Father, we thank you for the gift of armour, for the belt of truth, for the breastplate of righteousness, and for all the other pieces. We will wear our armour day and daily. We will take our stand upon the field of spiritual combat, and we will fight the good fight. We will prove ourselves to be soldiers of Christ, and we will live to the honouring of Christ. We will live for the sake of your glory. Give us the strength and the confidence and the wearing of our armour to fight the good fight for the glory of your name. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.